First of all, I'd like to thank uh, the university for hosting this event. It's uh, an absolute privilege and a bit scary to stand up for the first time in front of my family and friends. Um, usually I'm talking to sports scientists and students and academics who are really interested in my work and know about my work. So I figure I'm going to have to be a little bit gentle with you uh, and I'll try to reminisce a little bit about uh, what I think are the, the major decision making moments in my life and how they uh, eventually made me become what I am today. Um, I also want to try to make it be a little bit inspirational, if, even if it's only for my children, because uh, obviously I'd like to see them succeed in life, and um, they've got to have a few challenges ahead of them, so when they hear about how I made a few mess-ups and a few successes, maybe that might uh, help them. Uh, also, some of my uh, colleagues, some of you got huge workloads, teaching this, that and the other, well, you'll probably find out that most of us have been in the same situation and somehow we managed to get through it and become uh, professors, researchers and all the rest of it. So, uh, you can see uh, my title. I'd just like to say thank you to Vakar for being very kind. He's stolen probably all of my story, but I'll, I'll try to uh, embellish it a little bit. Um, uh, Jan also, uh, who is the head of school, um, she's been extremely supportive of me and also Rhonda Cohen um, who's the head of the London Sport Institute. So that's my thank yous over and done with. Um, I'm going to sort of leave the first few words as a bit of a, bit of a mystery. I'm going to bring, bring that back up a little bit later on. But uh, as you can see, I'm going to be talking about how I started off just loving sport and ended up with a career in sport. What, how much better can you get than that, eh? Brilliant. So, I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but um, you can see from my title that I'm pretty confident sort of chap. Um, maybe realism is a little bit missing, but um, I've taken a screenshot there of um, the first football program for Swansea City just after I was born. So this is a game that we call Swansea Town in those days. But you'll notice, if you can see, they're playing a 2-3-5 formation. Now that really is aging me, I can tell you. Five forwards, three midfielders and two defenders. That's, that's a long time ago. Nima, I'm going to have to tell you, I've been telling you fibs. Right? You know that film I made you watch? Where, I, where there's that young lad and he got you know, his teacher pregnant and he was the superhero and I said it was all about my life. Well, actually, I'm not 29 anymore. Sorry, but I'm a little bit older. Okay, I thought, I thought I'd just keep you, get you out of the dark on that one. Anyway, I took this screenshot and the first thing I noticed was there were two people in this team that have subsequently become very good friends of mine, which is a bit spooky, really. They were playing for... Uh, my home team. The first one on the left wing is Morgans. Uh, Ken, as I knew him, but he was known as Kenny Morgans. He was uh, best known for being a Busby babe. Um, for the youngsters, you won't know the Busby babes, but in 1958, uh, Manchester United were playing in the European uh, Championship, the Champions League equivalent, and uh, they'd flown back to uh, Munich, where they had to get a connecting flight back to Manchester. Uh, it was horrible conditions, really terrible. Um, the flight tried to take off twice. They have had to abort it. The captain said, look, that's it. We can't fly. It's, the conditions are atrocious. But uh, Matt Busby, the manager of Manchester United, said, look, we have to take off. I've got an important game on Saturday. So the, they tried one more time to take off. Unfortunately, they crashed. The plane was in, uh, in pieces, a number of their superstar players died as coaching staff. Terrible, terrible tragedy. Uh, Ken was one of those players. He was 18 years old, playing for his first year for Manchester United, playing on the left wing, and he disposed the current England left winger from the team. So you can imagine how well thought he was. Um, he was thrown from the wreckage and he was found eight hours later, uh, some hundred yards away from the plane, unconscious. Um, many, years ago, many years later, I was talking to him and he said, that was the day that my love of football left me, uh, which was a real tragedy in itself. 
Um, a few years later, he did go to play for his hometown Swansea, and hence he is playing uh, in that team. On the right wing is another player, Barry Jones, and I'm going to come back to him in a minute, but uh, he again became a very good friend of mine, which I thought was a bit, bit spooky, really. So, forward a few years to the age 10, and uh, by this stage, there is only one thing in my life, and that's football. I'm going to be the next Martin Shivers. Okay, well, he was my hero. You probably never heard of Martin Shivers, but for me, he was a footballing god. He played for Tottenham Hotspur, and uh, that was my life. Nothing else mattered at all. Um, you can see that um, I was obviously going to watch Swansea playing, playing football for a team in the morning, going to watch Swansea, and I was able to support two teams because they were miles apart in their abilities. Today, of course, Swansea are in the Premier League. They are the Welsh Barcelona and <laughs> probably getting pretty close to beating Swansea, uh, to beating Spurs. So, a couple of years later, I met my first crossroads, my first big thing that happened to me that changed my life significantly. The picture is uh, Gowerton Comprehensive School, so I've gone off to the big school and I feel like I'm going to make a bit of an impact. Okay, I've come from a very little village school. There's loads of people, but I'm a great footballer. I'm going to be the top guy in this school. So I go straight up to the PE teacher and say, okay, how do I get in the football team? Well, his answer wasn't quite what I was expecting. Um, he said, football? That Nancy boy game, we don't play that here. Boy, this is a rugby school. We don't play soccer at all. So my whole world fell apart. I was like, what am I going to do? Unfortunately, at age about 12, I didn't have the where for all to actually know what to do about it. I was just stumped. I can't play football. I certainly am not going to play rugby, that's for sure. Um, and it made a huge impact. And what I think happened is that my motivation was taken away from me. And so my teenage years, my, the title of that slide is taken from my favourite rock band at the time, The Undertones, and it sums up the way that my life was in my teenage years. I was just playing for kicks. It didn't matter what I did, it was going to be fun. If it was sport, I played for the cricket team, tennis team or whatever, I just wanted to have fun. Socialising, going out to bars, I know I wasn't 18, but you know, I looked quite old for my age. Um, I did quite a lot of driving, probably don't want to talk too much about that given the fact that I was a little bit young, but <laughs> I sort of got by, you know, you managed to su you su you survive. School on the other hand passed me by unfortunately. I didn't really excel at school at all uh, and to be honest I think they were quite pleased when I left. However, I did have very supportive parents and my mother in particular would badger me that I had to get my O-levels, I had to get my A-levels, and so on. And um, so for a couple of years, I did manage to pass a few exams and drifted around a little bit. I met uh, a very good friend who is a lifelong friend, Gary Jones, who is here today. And uh, unfortunately for him, uh, he had all the, the wrong side of me, really. We did all the, all the naughty things, and we didn't do so much of the great things. However, Gary has, has got a very successful career. He's built his own anaerobic digestion plant, re getting all of the household waste from the whole of Plymouth and turning it into electricity. Uh, unbelievable. Considering he left school without a single solitary qualification, probably thanks to me. <laughs> but I knew he could do it. Something rubbed off somewhere. OK, at the time, Gary's parents were running Pennard Golf Club, and I used to play snooker there. I got to be the snooker champion of the golf club, thinking everything was great. I was smoking 20 a day. I was drinking five pints in the evening. I was not really in great shape. Um, however, Pennard Golf Club decided to build two squash courts, and out of interest, I decided to have a little wander along, see what it was all about. And there's 15 ladders, so I figure, I'll join in the ladder 15, have a go, and see how it, see how it develops. 
And within about a month, I'd won a couple of games playing against the oldest people on the planet, the beginners, you know, not a great standard. I was coughing my lungs up in between games. I, I wasn't feeling great, but I decided this was something that I really wanted to achieve at. So I gave up smoking and I started trying a little bit harder with my A-levels. I sort of had a bit of direction in my life, which was pretty good. Um, it didn't all go swimmingly well. I did manage to do quite well in the squash. I won a few trophies, got into the first team, that sort of thing. But having been studying four A-levels, double maths, chemistry and physics, which for the life of me, I have no idea why I tried to do four A-levels. Probably blame my mother again. Um, <laughs> I hadn't done particularly brilliantly, and I wasn't going to get into university with the grades that I'd achieved. So, again, I'm, I'm at another crossroads. What am I going to do? And uh, I decided I was going to stay at home and redo the maths A-levels uh, on my own, which most people thought I was completely cuckoo. Um, my maths teacher said she'd help me with any problems that I had. The, university, the college wasn't putting on the A-level, so I couldn't go and study at the college. So I decided to have a routine. And there's my routine up there. Starting off with an early morning run. I'm, st I'm running 8K, 10K, that sort of thing every morning. I'm doing maths problems. I've got the four Bostock and Chandler books. I'm going through them. Got past papers. And the first past paper took me about two weeks to do a three-hour exam. And in time, I was getting to do a three-hour exam in three hours, which is great. But it took me a year, but I was getting fit, my squash was improving, and I'm feeling like I might be able to succeed. Unfortunately, I did. I managed, probably against most people's expectations, to, to do well. And I was offered a place at Brunel University, which is uh, fairly close to here. I can't exactly remember what the degree was, to be perfectly honest. It was a maths-related degree, but as you can probably guess, I didn't go. I was sitting down in my parents' kitchen one sort of late August time, and I came across the clearing pages. And I was just looking through, and this is where they list the sort of university degrees that have still got places left. And I saw the word sport, and it just jumped out at me. I was like gobsmacked, absolutely couldn't believe it. I didn't even know such a thing existed. A degree in sport, this is unbelievable. There was a phone number, so I phoned up, and uh, I was put through to Sid Aaron, who was the head of the Sports Institute at Cardiff. We had a quick chat. He said, where am I from, Swansea? He said, do you drive? Yeah, got a car? Fine. He said, hour and a half, you can be at the campus and I'll give you a guided tour. So I popped my head around the lounge. My father was sitting in his usual place watching TV. Uh, it didn't, doesn't move an awful lot. So I said, just off out, Dad. See you later, son. Back to sleep. And off I went. So I drove to Cardiff, met up with Sid Aaron, and he took me around the campus for about a 45-minute tour chatted, showed me everything, showed me all the different gymnasiums, all the equipment, and by the end of it, we went to his room, and I sat down, he said, right, I've got some good news and some bad news. The good news is, I've got, I'm going to give you a place. The bad news is, we're full. You'll have to wait a year. What do you want to do? And I was like, I'm, in, I'm waiting a year, that's not a problem, this is for me, I'm going to sign up for this course. Drove back, Three hours later, all right, Dad? Oh, where have you been there, son? Cardiff. What's that for? I've decided I'm going to do a degree in sport. He goes, a degree in what? <laughs> the next thing you're going to tell me, you're going to do flower arranging or bricklaying. I mean, you can't do a degree in sport. What's the matter with you? So we had a little chat. My mother came on board, we discussed it, and I told them that actually you can do a degree in sport. It's the scientific principles relating to sporting activities. We can look at you know, how people run, you know, how their heart rates, and all sorts of stuff. Really fascinating stuff. So I managed to just about convince him. 
Uh, he wasn't so keen on the fact that I delivered home for another year, <laughs> which uh, he had to support me. So we came to a bit of a compromise that I would do a HNC in computer science. Pretty early days of computing, but I figured with my maths background, I could do a little bit of computer programming, could put me in good stead for the future. And so I learned a lot of computer programming on that year and then went off to university. So it wasn't a totally wasted year, as you will probably find out in a bit. But at this point in time, the ball is well and truly rolling. I do the Human Movement Studies degree, and during that degree, I learned lots of different things. But the one thing that really got me going was something called notational analysis. And uh, the picture up there is a cover of a book written by a good friend of mine, Mike Hughes. Uh, some of my students will obviously know him very well. Mike was at Liverpool John Moores at the time, and he was also a squash coach. He was also a beer drinker, curry eater, Sudoku player, you know, he did he, very similar sort of attributes to myself. Um, I'd never met the chap, but he sounded like a really good guy. And he was doing analysis of squash, which is exactly what I wanted to do. I was at the time around about 50 in Wales, and I'm figuring, I, you know, what can I do to improve? How do I improve my performance? And so notation is a simple way of recording the events in a sporting contest. So, for example, I might put down ST for a straight drive or DR for a drop shot. And then we can sort of try to look at playing profiles. Do players play in a particular way? Is there a, is there a weakness in their game, strengths, and so on? And uh, so I did my dissertation in notation analysis and found 28 problems in my game, which is great. I've got some really good feedback here. I can work on those. Um, but at the end of graduating, I'm again at a sort of a, a bit of a crossroads. What am I going to do? And I'd sort of done an art, but really my, f my passion was in research. I wanted to carry on looking at any sort of research, but that's what I wanted to do. Unfortunately, in those days, there was no such avenue available to me. I couldn't do a, um, a PhD in sport at Cardiff, so I was a little bit flummoxed. My supervisor of my dissertation, Peter Treadwell, had just opened up the National Coaching Foundation uh, office in Cardiff. And um, he was pretty impressed with my dissertation. I'd written a computer program. So all that, that extra mile that I went came to fruition. So I'd written a computer program to an analyze squash. And he was pretty impressed. So he figured, well, I've got netball, hockey, rugby. There's a whole host of teams that were crying out for some sort of notation analysis system, and I could be the guy to deliver it. But what we needed to do is get me some sort of funding or whatever, keep me there. So Peter and I came up with an idea that we would write a research proposal to Cardiff <coughs> University's psychology department. And the reason why we chose psychology was that one of uh, the papers that I'd reviewed in my dissertation was called Eyewitness Testimony in Sport. It was written by a good friend, uh, Ian Franks, in Canada, and he had made the link between watching a game of sport and watching uh, a criminal activity. And so there's a lot of psychological research trying to understand how we behave when we are faced with criminal activities, you know, so face recognition, eyewitness apathy, all sorts of interesting stuff. So I wrote this research proposal, sent it down to Cardiff School of Psychology, and within a couple of days I had an invite to go down and meet with Professor Hayden Ellis, the head of school. Now what I didn't know was that Hayden was an eyewitness testimony expert. Not only was he an eyewitness testimony expert, he was a rugby fan. So I walk into his office, about the size of this room, I mean, a huge school of psychology, the number one in the UK. Walk in, and he said, bloody hell, Nick, he said, that's brilliant. I never thought of that. I've been doing eyewitness testimony for years. That's a brilliant idea. I'll supervise you. Come on board. You're, you're going to be my research student. So I'm like, this is brilliant. Uh, I said, how much does it cost? Don't worry about the fees, I'll sort that out. We don't have to charge you for that. I'm like, this is just too good. 
So about a month later, he says, right, you need to do a stats course. John Patrick on the seventh floor, he'll sort you out. So I knock on John Patrick's door, come in, introduce myself. Sport you've done. So what sport do you play? Squash. His little eyes light up. He's the squash captain. He's, he runs the university staff team. Are you any good? So I tell him a bit about myself. Brilliant. So I said, I want to do this stats course. Well, he said, as it happens, my teaching assistant has just left the university. Instead of doing the course, why don't you teach the course with me? <laughs> oh, all right then. So this gets better by the second. Yeah, we'll give you 30 pounds an hour. You can teach the course. Brilliant. So, uh, it, this Cardiff University is, is brilliant. I'm not, not as good as Middlesex, you understand, but it's not bad. <laughs> so, um, so, about six months later, John then comes, uh, invites me for a beer after we've uh, been working on the stats day and says, I've got a science and engineering research council PhD studentship and uh, you're the guy to do it. I've been really impressed with your work, with, uh, with all that we've been doing. Would you be interested? So I said, well, tell me a bit more about it. Well, it's the nature of expertise, looking at uh, how humans interact with computers, and we're working on a big project of British Steel. There's five people working on the project, um, but uh, it's a bit of a different area from what you're used to, but I'm sure you can do it. We'll give you £10,000 a year, all your fees paid, you get a PhD at the end of it. No brainer, I'm in. So, that's basically how I ended up going to do a PhD in cognitive psychology. Complete U-turn from where I wanted to go, but I was thinking to myself, well, this sort of opportunity doesn't come every day. And the other thing that really was sort of interesting to me, even though it is in a hot strip mill, which I thought sounded quite sexy, but in fact it's where they produce steel for making uh, cars. It's not sexy at all, unfortunately. But there's an awful lot of uh, interesting things. So they were looking at expertise and how experts develop. I figured, well, that's exactly what sports people do, isn't it? You know, that's something that should be really transferable. So, um, that sort of took me up for the next few years of my life, and then I was offered a job as a teaching assistant in Swans University, doing the same sort of stats teaching that I'd been doing at Cardiff. So while I was there, three-year contract, just coming to the end of it, thinking, okay, I'm now at ground zero again, what am I going to do? As luck would have it, and I get quite a bit of this luck, I have to mention, um, the university decides that they want to start the sports science degree. And I'm the only person with any sports background at all. So guess what? They offered me a job as a lecturer in sports science. Life gets no better, I can tell you. So, I start off as a lecturer. Things weren't quite as swimming as I thought they might be, because there's a list of all the modules that I had to teach. We had two members of staff, and we had three years of a degree to run. So the first year I had to write five modules, teach them, mark them, go to the exam boards and all the rest of it. Second year, same thing again, five new modules to produce, carry on teaching the other five. And the third year, I got another four more, plus the, you know, really you can get the idea. So research has gone completely out of my mind for a number of years. But at some point in time, we have dissertation students in the third year. And the first person I'd like to uh, re remind myself of is a guy called Andy Scalden. Now, Andy, along with a couple of other students, came to Swansea University simply because of a website that I'd created to advertise sports science. Now, I wasn't a particularly brilliant web designer, but whatever I'd done, if you did a Google search at the time for performance analysis notation, I was on the front page. This was brilliant. I was beating Cardiff, and by which time, Mike Hughes has gone there, and he's the big cheese, and I'm getting better hits than anybody else. So a number of students were coming to Swansea because they figured Nick was the guy who was going to get them a job in football, or whatever it was. So Andy was a Liverpool supporter, and uh, you can see him there with his Liverpool kit on. He came along and he did a dissertation with me in passing in the World Cup. And at the end of it, he said, look, I really want to get a job in soccer. What do you suggest? I said, let's turn, the turn that dissertation into a paper. 
we'll submit it to a journal and we'll send that paper to every single football club in the land. Thinking it might work, it didn't as it happened, but it is worth a try. But I also said we've got a conference in Belfast in June, let's go and present your work there. He presented, he was taken really, really well, fantastic reception. Prozone were there, which was the biggest company working in football at the time. They were just starting, work. they had about four or five Premier League clubs on their books. They saw him and said, do you want a job? But we haven't got a Premier League club for you, but we've got a job in the United Arab Emirates. We'll give you a free flat, tax-free salary. What do you reckon? <laughs> well, yes, you can imagine. He, he was on the first flight. Off he went. Uh, one year later, Prozone were taken on by Fulham, and Andy was given the job by Prozone to work for Fulham where he worked for a number of years, became the head sports scientist at Fulham, did a really good job, culminating in um, the England manager, what's his name? Current England manager? Hodgson. Roy Hodgson. Roy Hodgson went to Fulham as the manager. So Andy worked with Roy, did really well. Roy then goes to Liverpool, and then you get the picture, the Liverpool fan is working for Liverpool Football Club as head of sports science. What a, what a dream. Unfortunately, the dream was shattered nine weeks later when Roy Hodgson was given the sack, and so was Andy. But Roy is now the England manager, and he's the England analyst. OK, so this is around about 2000, 2001. And as I say, my only research was with dissertation students. This was one particular one where we're using a Vicon system, uh, biomechanics, 3D analysis, and we were really interested in penalty shootouts. It was just coming up to the World Cup, uh, 2002, and we were interested in some research that had shown that goalkeepers may be able to determine which way the guy's going to shoot simply from the sort of postural cues that this guy shows by leaning or whatever else it is. So Chris was a big, another big football fan, and so he did a study, and I thought, this is pretty good. We can submit this, we can present it at the BASES conference, which is the National Conference of Sports Science. So I spent three hours with him one evening, turning his abstract into what I thought was going to be good enough for the conference. Uh, we did it. I went along and presented for him. And there was Les Burwitz, the professor from Liverpool, John Moores in the front seat, and I'm quaking and all the rest of it. But the paper was well received. Um, Insight, which is the FA coaches manual, so all the, all the professional coaches take uh, a magazine called Insight. They run an article on our research on penalty kicking. London Evening Standard put us a big nice back page spread on Nick James tells England how to save the World Cup, we're not going to lose penalties to Germany next year and all that sort of stuff. Um, so again, Chris then came along and did an MPhil for me, and this is the first time that we could take on research students, because up until then we weren't a department, we were too small, and now all of a sudden we were able to take on research students, and then I figured, this is great. All of a sudden, people wanted to do MPhils with me. Uh, increasing my workload, but increasing the research, brilliant. And it's th at this point in time where I decided, well actually, I'm going to start struggling with my time here. Because, as Vakar said, I was doing a lot of playing of squash, I was coaching teams, I was going away for weekends. You know, it's a real time-consuming uh, occupation. If I was going to make it as a researcher, there was no way I could do four evenings a week and, you know, two weekends a month coaching squash. Also, I had some children. Didn't actually have three at the time. Alid wasn't even a little thought in my head, um, but Bethan and uh, Neo were around. And clearly I had to have some sort of parental responsibility. Uh, I also still have a wife, amazingly. Uh, most of my friends are quite amazed that that's still the case. Um, but there is also a little bit of a balance in act, and so I thought, quite long and hard before I made such a, a massive change in the way that 
I was living my life. As you can gather, sport has always been absolutely something I give 100% to, but I thought to myself, I might actually be able to make it as a sports scientist. So, uh, that's a sort of a little bit of synopsis that over just, you know, the next two years, 10 students out of 12 that registered in the sports science department registered with me as their supervisor. So clearly I was sort of doing something right, or I was teaching the right things, but I was pretty popular. Um, over a six year period, Tim is one of the people in the audience here, was one of my successful PhD students, but we had quite a few, three PhDs, eight MPhils coming through in a six year period. It was fantastic times, working really hard, but we were being successful. We published 19, how many, 19 journal, journal articles in that time. So I was getting work out there. All these students were becoming well known, and Swansea was being put on the map. At the same time, I started doing a little bit of work with Swansea City Football Club. Uh, one of my PhD students, Joe Taylor, was keen to work with, with, with the Swans. And if you can go and work with a professional team, you collect the data, it gives you a bit of face value, people, it attracts people and all the rest of it. So I went along to see Brian Flynn and uh, I walked into the old vetch, pretty old, horrible, dilapidated old ground. I walked in and he said, uh, OK, sir, Nick, are you a rugby man or a soccer man? Because we're in Wales. I said, definitely a soccer man. I said, I can prove it because the last time I saw you was at this very ground in 1981 when you were playing for Leeds United, getting absolutely battered by Swansea 5-0 in the opening game of the Division 1. Yeah, so well, we moved on from there pretty quickly. <laughs> but... We started a very fruitful, I started working with, uh, with Brian and went through a number of different managers, Martinez and, and so on. But uh, this season was a particularly important season because the last game of the season, Swansea needed to win the game to avoid being relegated out of the Football League. And so Brian asked me to produce a motivational video for the players. Uh, so that they could watch it on the bus and in the changing room and all the rest of it, really trying to get them G'd up for this game. Well, at the time, it was pretty tricky to produce a five-minute video of positive things for Swansea, but we, we, we searched through a lot of footage and we, we, we just about managed it. We had to get every player in. That was another challenge. But anyway, uh, they, the players watched it about 100 times. They, got, they, were, they won, 3-1. Anyway, brilliant. They stayed in the Football League. Now, how much a motivational video did, who knows. But we had another couple of articles in different newspapers, and, and everyone's happy. Brilliant. <clears throat> so, I would say that success probably tends to breed, breed success. My reputation probably was just starting at this point in time. Um, and I did my first keynote speech. That's the sort of, you're the big cheese, you know. You get invited along, the conference organized, pay for your flights and everything, and you stay in a nice hotel, and you feel like you've made it then. You don't even have to buy drinks anymore. This is marvelous, brilliant. So I managed to do my first keynote in 2006, and um, I think I've done 15 more in the next seven years. So that's pretty, pretty pleasing. Of course, uh, I managed to get some promotions, and that obviously helps uh, pay the bills, etc. And so what that really meant is that my job specification has completely changed. From the early days where I was just a teacher, teach, 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 go to lots of uh, meetings and all the rest of it, exam boards, now I'm doing research pretty much all the time. I help out on a master's program, do a little bit of teaching, run an intensive teaching program for two weeks in Hungary, that sort of thing. But mostly, I'm looking after seven PhD students. We have three more PhD students who want to enroll in October. Um, and so, as you can see, my role has completely changed. I also have made lots of international uh, friends. And uh, you can see there the five main countries that I, that I work with. Of course, my, my favorite and best uh, colleague and friend is Goran, who is here today. 
And I have to say I'm particularly gratified that he's come all the way from Slovenia with his family to be here today. That is going beyond the, uh, what you need to do, Goran. But um, we have made fantastic friends. We go on family holidays together. But we work like soldiers. We are looking after loads of different research projects. You know, Goran is slaving away on his SAGIT system, which is automatically tracking indoor sports. I do a little bit of writing here and there. He feeds me a bit of Lashko every now and again if I get tired. What a great partnership. So I sort of finish off my talk with a few examples of my work and where the sort of impact I think uh, I've made. And just a simple example to start off with. There's a typical bar chart that students will produce. This one was for uh, the incidence of passing in the different areas on a football pitch. We divided the football pitch up into 12. And it's sort of, well, you, can, well, you can't really, what, which area is 6 and which area is 7? It's not particularly useful. And that's, that's what Excel produces. That's what everyone does. So I just spent a little bit of time and came up with a slightly more intuitive uh, picture. There's a football pitch. You can see where the areas are. Fairly straightforward. However, even as long ago as last week, I still have students asking me, how the heck do you do that? Um, it's not particularly rocket science, but this is what I figure sports scientists, particularly if you're working in the applied area, you have to do. You have to tell a story very simply. If you can't tell a simple story, trust me, if you're working with footballers, you haven't got an awful lot of chance. <laughs> uh, so Joe Taylor was the guy that I told you about who got his PhD working with the Swans. Um, that was uh, um, what we call a conceptual framework of soccer, how we sort of imagine that soccer works. And by coming up with a, some sort of conceptual framework, we can then see how things work, how, which bits we need to analyze, and so on. Um, Joe, I thought, was going to take over as, as my job as a lecturer at Swans University. But he said, look, Nick, I've spent all this time, six years working in sports science. I really want to go and put this to use. I went to be a, an applied practitioner. And so his first job was with British Disability Swimming, uh, totally unrelated to soccer, but he was the first analyst for disability swimming and went to Paralympics and all the rest of it. Uh, last week, he's just been promoted, and he's now the head, uh, head Paralympic something scientist. I can't remember exactly, but talent scientist. So they created a new job which is looking at the next cycle, working with the Olympics. And Joe's uh, got this a mo much more theoretical and uh, applied job. Uh, here's another picture of uh, one of my current PhD students, Gethin Rees. Uh, he's the head analyst for Swansea currently. Um, and the picture that I show there is what I call a form chart. This is a way of depicting lots of different variables on one chart with one scale. So we have to transform our variables to produce a chart where we have two dotted lines, and any bar that's between the dotted lines is normal behavior. So when we show this to the coaches, they can just go, yeah, we performed where we would expect on these different criteria. And if we're lower or higher, then we've had good or bad performance. Pretty simple. One of the coaches said to Gethin a couple of weeks ago, Go on, Geth, he said, you must be a freaking brilliant scientist, genius to be able to do that, because they're all different. They should have lots of highs and lows. You must be a genius. And Gethin just went, yeah, yeah, that's me. <laughs> that's all down to me. Perfect. <coughs> so um, the picture, the, I've got a couple of uh, icons of uh, Premier League sides. Next year, if anyone here wants to go and watch any of those teams, then that's where all my ex-students are working. So we can get you a couple of free tickets. Um, but on a more serious note, uh, the work that we've been doing in soccer over the years, um, there's, there's a whole host of, if you're going to be publishing in the sport, soccer's the one to do. There's loads and loads of them. Um, and we have lots of competitors in Spain and all the rest of it. And we sort of figure that we are coming up with some good stories. And one of the stories that we've been coming up with, which is relatively simple, is that when 
typical researchers are putting lots and lots of teams together and looking at what Premier League teams do or top five teams in the league do. We think that this is probably not a good way to approach it because there are so many individual differences between teams and currently our research is trying to show how if we, if we tell a story about how Premier League teams play, we're probably going to be right for maybe one or two teams and all the others are going to be completely different. So we're thinking on an individual team basis. Um, a couple more of my uh, PhD students who work at the English Institute of Sport. The top one is Julia Wells. She's the uh, GB Canoe Slalom analyst. They did exceptionally well in the Olympics, winning, uh, I think it was two gold medals or a gold and a silver. Uh, Julia, has, her work is, is quite interesting because canoe slalom, every single time they race, the, the, the course changes completely. The waves, the eddies, everything changes. And our challenge is to try to come up with measures that are meaningful. How do we assess a performance on a particular course in comparison to others? We're always looking for medal performance. What sort of time do we need to be meddling on these different types of courses? So again, quite a lot of statistical uh, analysis required there. The lower down one is Stafford Murray. This is one of, uh, this is a favourite picture. He is um, working for the England squash team there as the head analyst. Currently he's uh, now the head analyst for the English Institute of Sport. So he oversees 25 biomechanists and performance analysts. Um, and he's doing his PhD with Goran and myself, uh, looking at performance in squash using Goran's uh, overhead uh, automatic tracking system so that we can work out how fast, how far, uh, you know, that sort of stuff. So with Stafford being the head analyst at the English Institute of Sport, that naturally made uh, a good link for me. And I've been working as an academic consultant for them for about the last three or four years. Uh, that means that I'm called upon to offer advice to different teams. Uh, and so I've got two examples here. One of, uh, one of them was for GB Gymnastics. And uh, Rebecca Edgington, who was the analyst for them, asked me about um, coming up with some statistical methods to try to work out different weightings between the different events, which was quite important for trying to target different practice regimes and all the rest of it. Um, GB Cycling, we've had a couple of our ex-students working for them. Again, highly successful uh, sport. Um, just before the Olympics, I was asked to come up with an algorithm to determine who we were going to pick to race in the Omnium which is a new event where they all cycle around together and one person gets pulled out at the end of each lap. And the, the goal was, do we pick a road cyclist or a track cyclist for this event? Because no one knew. So my job was to look at the stats to try to pick the best person for the job. Uh, so moving on to my new frontiers. I hope you like your picture, Nima. I think you've been, on, you think you've been eating veggies for a, about a couple of weeks there. You're looking pretty fit. He's looking pretty, pretty strong. Dear me. Uh, so Nimai is, my, is one of my most recent recruits. He's just started a PhD. Very fortunate. Um, the university awarded 25 studentships this year, and Nimai was one of the recipients. So he's now going to be a three-year full-time student. He's got data from Opta, which is the biggest stats collecting company in sports. And uh, Nimai has managed to get hold of all of the rugby league data. Um, he's also going to be working for the Italian rugby league team in the forthcoming World Cup. So he's doing OK. He's presented at three conferences already. He's got a book chapter. Uh, he's, he's moving on pretty sharpish. Uh, the next one on the bottom, Mike Hughes. Uh, this is Mike Hughes Jr., Mike Hughes Sr.'s son. And Mike. Um, as is currently the um, England rugby team's analyst. He's at the moment over in Australia with the British Lions, and uh, so he's got a 10-week period of solid work, living in five-star hotels, <laughs> £20,000 little backhander on top of his salary, 
I think I'm in the wrong job here. I mean, we don't get those £20,000 backhanders, do we? Mike's career, he started off, his first job was the uh, head analyst for England Squash. Second job was the head analyst for GB Cycling. And the third job is the head analyst for England Rugby. God, with this, this is a great place to be, eh? Okay, so, I guess that pretty much is, uh, is all I really want to say. Um, I guess probably what my, my story has been is that um, I've, along the way, I've had to make some decisions. Uh, do I do a PhD in something like cognitive psychology, which really I have not the faintest idea about, you know? Can I take on board teaching statistics one week before the course starts, which I had never done it before? Well, you know, I sort of, as I said right at the outset, I've got confidence. Maybe it's false confidence sometimes, but I certainly have a go for things. So I figure in that uh, maybe my new job could be a football coach. I've got a son. He's looking good. He's scoring lots of goals. Premier League in 10 years, Al. Is that OK? I can retire. What do you think? No, maybe not. OK. Well, perhaps, that, uh, perhaps that's a little bit uh, a step too far. Um, but, as I said, I've had to make some decisions over the years. And um, what I'd like to say as the last parting shot is that, you know, you make some choices in life. Not always are they the best ones. But, you know, if you don't try, you don't get there. Fair enough? So, I sometimes ask myself, why did I do it? And probably there's a couple of real questions I have to ask. Why? Why? Why was that? Why? What happened there? <laughs> okay, thank you very much.